Thank you all. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Vaughan Lindsay, who is the Chief Executive of Blockchain Trust and also a board member of SSE International, the international network that we're part of. So Vaughan will say a few words of welcome. Please, Vaughan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for, well, welcome everyone, and thank you for letting us use this wonderful venue. It was very grand, I have to say, very, very special. Um, I was in uh, London the other day, and I was, as you do, rushing uh, between meetings. And I decided, because it was a warm day, I would, instead of taking the tube, I would walk along the street to the next meeting. And in doing that, I was walking along the street, and I saw a dreadful accident. I saw this car uh, drive by and knock this cyclist uh, off the bike. Um, and this, it was a, a, a lady got knocked off by bike, completely dazed and confused on the floor. Um, and to my surprise, I found myself immediately rushing over to want to help. But what I noticed was pretty much everybody else just carried on walking by. That they saw this person on the floor and they walked by. Lots of people looked and thought, oh, well, somebody else will uh, deal with that person. And the majority of people walked by. And I found myself uh, needing by this person. With this. The only other person was a little old lady who also felt compelled to do something to help this person. Now, in the end, fortunately, the person wasn't badly hurt, um, and they were able to sort it out. But it left an impression with me that despite what we all think, we all sit there and think, you know, if we see something wrong or there's something that needs to improve, we'd all, of course, want to do something about it. But in practice, I think precious few people do. We all like to believe we could, but very few people have the courage to actually step forward potentially make a fool of themselves as they try to do something they're not quite sure what to do, but in doing that are trying to solve a problem and do something about that. Uh, what we will hear today is from SSE students who are all of that mould. <coughs> These are people who have seen something wrong that they want to do something about and make a difference and have the courage that few of us have to actually step forward and make a difference uh, in this world. Um, and whenever I hear them, I know it sounds a cliche, but I genuinely feel humbled. I don't think I would have the courage to do many of the things that these people do. And I think it's remarkable that they do this. And I think it's great that we have an opportunity to celebrate what they do. I also think it's wonderful that we're able to offer sort of, the support programme for, from SSE. <coughs> because having ambition and drive and the desire to make the world a better place is sadly not enough. You also need to have support and skills to be able to do that. And one of my great uh, um, idols was a guy called Michael Young. Um, Michael Young, who became Lord Young of Dartington and was the person who set up SSE. And his big mantra was, everybody, given the right support and encouragement, can do remarkable things. And to me, that's what the SSE programme is about. It's about providing a structured programme that enables remarkable people to have the skills to go with their confidence and courage and ideas to go out into the world and do remarkable things. Um, and I think that is a precious commodity. So I am both inspired by the, the courage of the people who step forward and make, try to make a difference to the world. I feel proud to be part of SSE because it provides the essential support that enables people to make that step. And I remember that same feeling when I went to help the person who'd come off their bike, this sense of, sort of slight panic that you rush over to do something and then you think, oh crikey, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. I didn't know quite what to do and you want somebody to help you along the way. And of course that's what the SSC programme does. I'm also delighted that you'll be joining a band of fellows across the country. There are 13 programmes across the country of the SSC. They will of course say it's international as well, with programmes in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. So you're joining an elite uh, band of people. Um, and I would just like to use this opportunity to welcome and thank all the uh, SSE students. I know it's been, it always is a bit of a journey to get to this point, and I think we have a great opportunity to celebrate and give them the, the confidence and the support that they will need. It is hard work uh, uh, pushing boundaries and doing things that nobody else has the courage to do, and it can be quite lonely and quite isolating. And this is a great opportunity for us to show solidarity and support for those. So before we hear from them, I think we should give them a round of applause in anticipation for the wonderful <laughs> things that we are going to hear.
And I'm going to hand over at that moment to Tracy. Hello everybody, um, and thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. Um, I am really looking forward to hearing all about the, um, the businesses that, um, that you've set up and um, much more about the, uh, the involvement you've had with the uh, with School for Social Entrepreneurs. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating you all to getting to this point. Well done. You just deserve um, so much praise for taking that gem of an idea and doing something with it. So many people uh, sit at home or sit in their, their jobs, whatever they're doing, and think, I could do. And actually, so often it's about how do you do? How do you take that step forward? And I'm so pleased that that support is here for you um, through the, uh, the programme that you've been involved in uh, to help you take that first step. And certainly, um, I'm going to be watching, I think, with some pride, having been here this afternoon, um, about your, your journey and the steps that you're taking. Um, not least of all, because uh, Plymouth is um, uh, one of the first, I think Gareth here, social enterprise cities. Um, and so the, the way in which we develop social enterprise in the cities is very much part of our business mix. We want to encourage social enterprise. We want you here. We want you to develop your ideas. And particularly those social values that come with your businesses are so important to the life of our city. Not least of all from us as a city council, um, because we are a cooperative council, and being able to share work together, collaborate for social value is absolutely uh, what we're about and what we, what we want to do. Um, so we are very proud of, of having you here and we're very proud of the number of social enterprises that we've got in the city. Um, making sure that that business support is, um, is, is there for all our businesses is, is absolutely um, essential. And as part of that, the, the City Council um, has a, an economic development um, officer that is specifically there to, to work with social enterprises. There's not a lot of councils that can say that, that we're very much uh, pushing forward and making sure that we're providing that, that support. Um, we recently launched a, a £500,000 social enterprise investment fund. Um, very often finance is an issue for, for business, whatever that business might be, um, and that's very much proving to be uh, successful. And I'm so pleased um, that I can announce, and I have to read it because it's hot off the press, um, that this week we've um, there's a total of £300,000 being awarded uh, to six social enterprises um, in the city, leading to 30 new jobs in the city. So really, really, we're trying to put our money where our mouth is in terms of social enterprise in the city. Um, and that includes includes a community interest company providing vocational training uh, with plans to open a shop to sell refurbished and electric bikes, um, a trust that uh, wants to convert an empty care home into an HQ um, hub and incubator business space, and a bakery uh, creating a baking school offering skills training and vocational opportunities um, for people. Um, what diversity <laughs> in those areas, and I think that's the other part of social enterprise and what it brings to the mix that we have uh, for, for businesses. Um, there are so many different opportunities in so many different uh, sectors. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say this afternoon, uh, celebrating your success with you um, and um, looking forward to, to meeting you all um, after the, the formalities of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tracy. And I'm not going to give you another speech here because I'm really looking forward to seeing our students um, doing their presentations. Just to help you through that, in your goodie bags, you have got a brochure. And actually, the presentations are in the order in which they're on the brochure. So if you want to follow the presentations, make, you know, just as a sort of aid memoir, go with the brochure. And very importantly, in your goodie bags, you also have a pledge book. And this is really for you, if you're particularly touched by one of the entrepreneurs, if you want to engage with them, for you to sort of put your name down, your contact details, and, you know, tell them what you can offer them, tell them, you know, any kind of leads you have, any contacts you can offer them, or if you just want to be informed of their progress, you know, tick that box. So you've got that, you've got the brochure, and without further ado, I'm handing over to Sam and our students to kind of wow us with their... Project. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm not sure if I'm going to wow you, but it's the middle of the afternoon. We're heading on towards the, uh, and in my mind, that means it's time for a story. And I want you to cast your minds and imaginations back to the winter just gone, when an area of Somerset much larger than Greater Plymouth was underwater, deeply flooded, for three months. And the village just up the road from my house was cut off for three months, and the children went to school uh, by boat. It wasn't uncommon to see people drive as far as they could in a car and take an inflatable canoe out of the back of the car and continue their journey in the canoe and in waders. And the streets that had been used as a link to the world uh, became a paddling ground for families of very beautiful swans and other water birds. Ladies and gentlemen, nearly two months after the floods began, the Prime Minister flew in by helicopter accompanied by the inevitable media crews. He was gone again in just over an hour, I know he's a busy man, uh, and the media were gone almost as quickly. And in the pub a couple of days later, there was a dear farmer who put up in his lifetime with every form of human catastrophe probably known to men and women. And he said, I can sort of handle the floods, but I just can't handle the media. And ladies and gentlemen, the big boys of broadcasting, and arguably, I would argue, the big boys of politics don't quite understand the countryside and sometimes don't know it all that well. I'm talking here in Plymouth, of course, you're surrounded by the sea, you fight down very Cornwall on one side, so it's not just a rural issue. Country people, when asked how they feel about being treated by the media, say they feel as if they're in a living zoo. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> they feel as if they're in a living zoo. Uh, that their lives are being reported as if it's fond news coverage. Ladies and gentlemen, the countryside, I would argue, needs a new singer and a new song, and that's what we're trying to do with Wild Country Media. We're setting up the first ever national internet TV service for rural Britain, for people who live in the countryside and people who love the countryside. And next year, we'll go live uh, with... Uh, Video reports, documentaries, great films, challenging journalism. I hope that's a voice of support from wherever it is in the world. Challenging journalism um, on smart TVs, on iPads, on every form of tablet, on smartphones. And then we establish an audience, we'll move over to conventional broadcast TV. Not only a new singer, but very much a new song. Slow TV. Solutions TV, in the sense that we want to tell stories that focus on how things can be fixed and can be better, rather than how things break down. And in a sense, because it's a social enterprise, people TV. We want the audience, rather than being talked to, to take a much greater part in telling the story, being part of the story, and thankfully, I think we now have a meeting place of technology and audience where that is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, you might say, well, how can this possibly matter? Because we have all the media we could want. And I would say, when my daughter was a tiny toddler, over many years we told a running bedtime story about a gang of animals who'd escaped from London Zoo, tired as they were of the treatment by humans. Uh, and they set up home and a woodland at the bottom of our garden reached only by inevitably a magic door. And the only human being who was allowed to visit this colony of animals was the local newly retired vet. It was the only human being trusted by the animal kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, for many years when my daughter was young, she, sought, she searched through the hedge in the woodland to try and find the magic door that would take her through to the animal kingdom. She's now preparing for her GCSEs, what does Holly want to do in her life? She wants to be a vet. And I would argue that without good storytelling, a healthy tribe is not possible. Uh, we need stories, good stories, collaborative stories, to understand not only who we are as individuals and communities, but what the future possibilities are. And that's what we're trying to do, ladies and gentlemen, at Wild Country Media. We believe that stories are a matter of life and death, that we need stories also for a better world. Now this is going to be a gigantic David and Goliath struggle. We're a small social enterprise, and the annual income of the BBC alone, God bless them, is probably about three and a half billion pounds. 
So when we set up next year, the first, board, the first meeting of the trustees of this new operation takes place in two weeks' time. The channel, if that's what we can, we can call it anymore, uh, sets up and launches next year. We'd love you to be a friend, and if you'd like to find out any more about this, what is for me life-changing and really exciting, potentially revolutionary broadcasting project. If you'd like to find out more, be a friend, come and see us in the exhibition hall, leave a name, and I'd love to talk. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and I hope you have a lovely afternoon. Is it on? Oh, I'll try and um, drown out the noise of the street driving. Hello, um, my name is Joanna and my project is called Different Together. And I want to begin by asking you all a question. What do you think when you hear the word autistic? To most of us who don't have a personal or professional connection with autism, it's probably quite frightening. In 2012, when my husband and I were on the verge of divorce, a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, a condition on the autism spectrum, saved our marriage. Autism still carries a stigma only because people don't understand it. Here are some statistics. For those that don't know, Asperger's syndrome, or AS, affects the critical ingredients to form and maintain intimate relationships. Let me repeat that. Asperger's syndrome affects the critical ingredients to form and maintain intimate relationships. It's important to understand that if you meet one person with AS, you have met one person with AS. Each person is as different as everyone in this room I do not believe that AS itself is the biggest problem for partners. The problem is lack of awareness. Without knowledge of or understanding of AS, many couples are struggling with their relationships, not just with their partners, but with their children. It is a very lonely place being a partner of someone with AS. There are plenty of resources for those with a diagnosis. So I've got myself there. <laughs> For those with a diagnosis, but there are none for their partners. We desperately need connection with others, those in the same situation as we are. Different Together provides this connection in the form of a website that enables partners to connect on a forum and in person. The site, which went live this year, is full of information and resources, including recommended reading, counsellors, blogs and news of conferences and events. Different Together will improve awareness, it will combat stigma, and it will improve mental health, and it will reduce the burden on public health services. With the help of funding from the SSE programme, a huge amount has been achieved in the last year. However, this achievement has highlighted a need that was far greater than even I had imagined. In order to deliver the full potential of Different Together, I need help in particular to provide short-term funding until the conferences are established, which is estimated to be October 2015, experience in the form of an advisory board, that's financial, general business and health professionals. And lastly, I need volunteers to help with the website administration. If any of what I've shared with you today has ignited an interest in Different Together, please come and talk to me later when I can give you more details and answer any questions you might have. Professor Tony Atwood, who is patron of Different Together, has said that this site will literally save lives, and I truly believe it will. Thank you. Where do you go to find a space that allows you to reconnect with yourself? Where could you go that provides the right environment to explore your creativity? 
Computers and technology have their part to play in our learning and development. But because we are continually bombarded in our daily lives, it's easy to lose that connection with ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. When a client spends a day with me, I wake up skills and wake up abilities they knew they never had. My workshops are imaginative and totally experiential. Let me explain. I deliver one, two, three day bespoke workshops for groups of eight to ten people. Using traditional green woodworking skills, we make musical instruments, xylophone, shakers, rasps, all tuned and ready to play. Once finished, we have fun composing short pieces of music. I record these compositions and the people leave with those recordings and the instruments they've made. So what's it about? Well, it's about the process. <clears throat> it's about hands-on creativity. It's about channeling energy into a practical craft. Research has shown that creative woodwork can lead to a greater physical and emotional well-being. A sense of worth and an increase in self-confidence. It helps people to relax and it increases the ability to cope with stress. It improves physical dexterity and hand-to-eye coordination. All these are transferable skills. Music therapy is found in nearly every area of the helping professions. Development mental work in communication, motor skills within individuals with special needs, rhythm workshops for relaxation. So just imagine what a combination of the two mediums could achieve. My workshops are totally mobile. They can be set up anywhere. I provide all of the tools and sustained resource materials. I can run workshops in city centres, village halls, community centres, wherever the need is, creating an environment free of technology, making it a grounding, hands-on experience. <coughs> These courses provide the opportunity for those who are less physically or financially mobile, or are challenged mentally, mentally or emotionally. Such people have a need for therapeutic transformational experiences. Today, I'm looking for NHS, um, sorry, referrals to NHS buyers, hostels, residential care homes, drug rehab units, hospices, SMC, SAM schools. So just to conclude, Greenwood Music is a social enterprise aimed at bringing a unique, all-inclusive experience into people's lives. And I would like to talk to people, uh, any, talk to anyone interested in what I have to offer. Thank you. Can I say thank you for having me? Because I'm from Torbay. Hands up if you're from Torbay. Okay. Okay. Thank you for having me. Um, this little house represents community enterprise in the making. Would you look after it for me? There is a place of painting with a house setting grounds. A new youth adventure centre with sports hall, climbing hall, wall, a BMX and skateboarding park. It was intended to be for young people, but it costs too much. It isn't quite working, there's no ongoing funding, and gradually its original vision is being eroded. We started with a vision. House. Torbay's first creativity centre for children and young people, with those perceived as vulnerable at its heart. I worked on the idea with a group of young people and a project group made up of the private, public and voluntary sector. First off was to run a feasibility project. Together we approached 13 separate grant givers, investors and commissioning bodies. All 13 said yes. They said yes because they believed the idea could work. This summer, our young team trained as consultants and supported by artists, they took house out on tour, visiting 16 play days across Torbay, using creative making as a springboard for conversation. They talked to people aged 1 <coughs> to 93, and they ran a creative summer school at Ockham Farm. Altogether this summer, we heard the voices of over 2,000 local people. They told us where the gaps are, 
They told us what they wanted, and a focus has evolved. It should be for everyone. It should be sustained. It should create space for people to thrive, connect, and learn through doing. It should find a way for this idea to solve a Torbay problem. This project will transform a failing MyPlace youth hub into a vibrant community resource, supported by organisations and owned by the local community. 31 will not differentiate between sport and creativity, but celebrate both. 31 will provide 80 adults with learning disabilities the opportunity to be part of the solution. It will house a new children's scrap store, meeting the waste and environment agenda. It will support a quality art shop, studio space, and a gymnasium. It will develop a community bus service to enable sustained connection. It will offer training and employment opportunities for young people 16 to 24, but for adults with learning disabilities as well. 31 different organisations, social enterprises, CICs, trusts and businesses are building a scaffold to support the construction of an inspiring community enterprise with a vibrant youth culture. 31 scaffold poles. They're strong in their own right, but when they're clamped together, they're even stronger. 31 partners working collaboratively collaboratively to strengthen the cultural and recreation offer in Torbay for children who come from Torbay and visiting. By broadening the offer, we widen the audience. By sharing a business model, we work collectively to generate income, create employment and promote social inclusion. A bursary scheme will run across the whole programme created by Activity Income. We buy from each other. The community kitchen buys from the community garden. The creative play scheme buys from the scrap store. From Nova, November on, we will be making our business plan, creating space for active membership and introducing community shares, working towards community ownership. Together, the people of Torbay are drawing a handle on the door. The little house we started with and the vision inside is still there, but now, there's a scaffold around it to help make it grow. You can help make it grow by buying a community share. With every community share, we will be giving away a scaffold connector to keep you involved and connected to 31, creative community enterprise in the making. Thank you. Hello everybody, welcome. Um, before I tell you a little bit about my project, I'd like to tell you um, just a little something that is recently come out, uh, published by the World Bank. Um, they've set out that um, essentially our world needs to produce 50% more food to, produce, uh, to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Climate change is also affecting things and it's going to reduce crop yields by 25%. That means our land, biodiversity, oceans, forests are being depleted at an alarming rate. And unless we start to change the way that we grow our food, food security, especially for the world's poorest, will be at risk. So my project is uh, eco-effective. It's, it's been set up to try and play its own part in this crisis. Um, and so two parts have been uh, created, um, mainly from the idea that if you don't measure it, how can you manage it? Um, so from that, crop has been created to measure the impact and efficiency of farming, whilst EEMS, the Electronic Environmental Management System, has been created to try and help manage those impacts. So crop is, the is a free website and it allows food producers, farmers, to log in, enter the details of their farm, put in their yield, put in the crop that they're growing, um, put in their size, type in all the resources that they're using, whether it's energy, fuels, water, whatever it is, it will then automatically do a calculation for them, give them a carbon footprint, give them an environmental impact, um, and then also, well, obviously give them their yield per, per acre. The then unique part of this is then that it will go in and it will league table cut for people. So then users can go in, see a high score like they would see on a video game, 
go in and instantly compare themselves against others. It's not there. Then a forum would allow people to then go and contact their users directly and try to find out, oh, hold on, you're growing 20 tonnes of carrots more than I am for my 10 gallons of diesel, and try to find out directly what's going on. Um, the, uh, electronic EMS or, is uh, there to try and help these organisations manage their impacts. It's a cloud-based service, so people would log in, uh, and every year they'd be able to set environmental targets to try and improve their efficiency. In addition, this site would also allow them to be legally compliant and enable the organisations to meet the standards for ISO 14001, an international environmental standard. Um, this, we've done a fair trial of this. It's been in operation at Paint and Zoo for over a year and it's gone down very well. All of this work so far has been extremely technical. Um, <laughs> we're still aiming for a launch certainly after Christmas. Um, there's lots of little tidying up that needs to be done for it. And this for me has been an extremely challenging but really rewarding year. Still work to be done. Um, and so now the ask. Um, I suppose basically what I need is I need people to shout about this. There's no point in putting all this on if nobody's ever going to use it. I need users, I need people to be talking about this. Um, of course, if anybody knows how I can access any <coughs> funding or grants, that would be amazing. Web people don't exactly come cheap. Um, of course, if you've got any of this expertise, then I'd love to hear from you as well. And of course, if nothing else, if you could just give me some general encouragement and give me a pat on the back, that would be very well received. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Excuse my glasses here. I'm Sheena Leaf. I have the pleasure of being the learning manager here at Plymouth um, and accompanied our good and fine students on their journey this year. When people join the SSC, we ask for commitment to their enterprise, to themselves and the programme and to other members of the cohort. As you're beginning to hear, this SSC year is a roller coaster of ups and downs and everyone's personal circumstances interweave as their enterprises develop at different paces. Something that can be constant is peer support. And we have introduced this Peer of the Year Award to recognise the importance individuals play in each other's journey. That person who goes above and beyond makes you laugh while you're feeling rubbish. The person that inspired you with their actions, who listened when you needed help, who was generous with their time, their networks, their advice, etc. Someone who made a difference. We did ask our students to vote for their Peer of the Year and I can announce there are two joint winners. I'd like to tell you the comments that were made on those voting slips. This person has been so generous in sharing her knowledge, information, expertise and experience. Totally inspiring. This person has achieved so much despite all their commitments and challenges. They are an inspiration. For the other person, this person has stayed the course and really grown as a person. This person always has a smile, an ear, and a hug for everyone. I'm going to open the envelope, but I know who they are. <laughs> so I'd like to step forward, please, Jane Hardy and Gareth Rockwell. inspired so much by all of these students. They've kept me going, gave me a kick up the backside when I needed it, and actually drove me to where I am today, really, and I'm going to keep on driving. Doesn't matter what help I get, it's much grateful what help I get, but I'm going to keep on driving forward. Thank you very much. Go on, go on, stay I don't even know what to say, I can't believe it. I'm so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I voted for you. <laughs> 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 I just don't even know what to say. I feel like everyone should be here, really. Um, I'm just so inspired by everyone else, I can't believe they're inspired by me, so thank you. <laughs> 
What is leadership? Who is a leader? Am I a leader? Are you? Are you? I believe we all are. We all have an immense potential to lead, and we all have a responsibility to do so. No one is incapable of leadership. But I haven't always felt this way. I became a single parent in January of 2012. The new year rang in some major changes for my family. My son was 17 months old and I was 14 weeks pregnant. In the space of a fortnight, we left our house, moved in with family three and a half hours journey away, left our friends, my job, and the only home that my toddler had known. There are a few words to describe the overwhelming feelings of fear, loss and sadness that this transition brought. In fact, the only word that could describe it is grief. I certainly did not see myself as a leader. But that is exactly what I was then and now, more so than at any other time in my life. Because I am the leader of my family. I am the decision maker, the guide. My actions and my example will teach my children what to expect from life and what life should expect of them. Millions of women like me find themselves in this position every day. Many become lone parents at the end of a relationship that has also taught them that they are weak, worthless, unlovable. Millions of mothers are asked to step into the role of lone parent, leader of their family, when they feel desperately ill-equipped to do so. Domestic abuse will affect one in four women in their lifetime. Not all will experience violence, but of those that do, 97% say that it is fear for their children which will ultimately motivate them to leave. These children are witnesses and victims too. Children who become young adults, men and women. Children who are the products of the quality of leadership their parents had. This is not a women's issue. Lone mothers are raising boys and girls, setting the foundations for the relationships of tomorrow. Relationships that will shape society as a whole. So how do we take victims and create leaders? Coaching helps. My experience of being coached transformed my life. Now, as a qualified life coach, I have created two programmes to support women, children and young adults, to step into the place of power and integrity we all have within us. Family Vision is a course for women with children under five. Get Up and Grow is a self-leadership program for 16 to 24 year olds. I work with people who too often are done to by agencies designed to support them, perpetuating a victim mentality which triggers ongoing depression, lack of self-belief and insecurity. Through coaching, I'm working to inspire these same people to take control of their own destiny, to be brave, to be strong, to become the leaders of their own lives. With them, I find a still and quiet place where creativity and hope can be found. Today, in this still and quiet place, I would like to invite you to be leaders, to be champions, to be guides. Family Vision, needs a small investment to extend our successful pilot in preparation to scale up. We plan to license the programme by January 2016 and take it to family workers, teachers, youth workers and other professionals so they can bring coaching and empowerment to the leaders of tomorrow. Whatever you might be able to offer, I welcome your involvement and look forward to meeting you. Thank you. I've done one just now. <laughs> vision. Everybody's got a vision. If it's not their jobs, not their family, it's going to be something else. My vision was my son to start with and martial arts. As an ex-offender, I was a bit lost. I went to drugs and other things. Within martial arts, it kept me grounded 
I found a good team. I found things to keep me inspired and keep me moving on and keep me focused and grounded. It wasn't about just hitting different people with pads, but being part of a team, part of something. Another part of my vision, after 13 years of being in the sport, was teaching. Teaching different people, children with autism, and other problems. Another person is part of the vision was Barry Hartshorn. Barry's here today. He's one of my students. About three years ago, he just got out of prison, was feeling lost, needed a focus, needed to be part of a team. So he joined us at Russell's Mai Tai. Within them three years, he's found himself to stay out of trouble. He's found himself taking part in 16 interclubs, which is a semi-contact part of the sport. He's on his fifth full contact fight and he hasn't re-offended, which is brilliant. Barry's carrying on now and Barry said to me himself, probably about a couple of months ago, if it wasn't for the sport itself, he doesn't know where it'd be. And Barry's here today. If you want to ask him that question, he will gladly answer it. Another part of my vision is to help people, is the main part. Another one of the students I've helped, <laughs> my brother, I say that, is Ashley Card. Ashley Card has got cerebral palsy and finds it very frustrating sometimes. His parents done him a lovely little padded room so he can take his frustration out, frustration out in. But he doesn't use that room anymore because he gets me in there with the pads to help him with his frustrations. I've helped him with moving his arms, getting him straighter, giving him focus, belief. And he's a very inspiring person on his own, which I'm inspired by myself, just working with him. Another big part is team. I've recently been working with Plymouth Special Olympics Club, which to be honest, I'll tell you the truth, I left there with the biggest smile and the biggest feeling in my heart ever, I've ever felt from anything. When they come to my class, they left their other classes and joined my group, which I was privileged. They all took part and embraced me, which I'm going back on the 22nd of this month. I'm gonna be part of them again. They're not gonna get rid of me that easy. The main thing I wanna do is not be like any other gym in Plymouth. If people wanna to come to my gym and get fit, they can come to my gym and get fit from any walk of life, or be part of a team, or get any help. You're more than welcome. I wanna reach out today, really, and ask people if they wanna help the Barrys, the Ashleys, and the great people here from the Special Olympics with funding, with any help they can give us, with space, i.e. somewhere we can have residence, so we can help these people, then just give me a shout. I'll be on my store, I'll answer any questions. The main thing is just to keep this in your head. And if you feel like you can do something, then don't just sit there and think, oh, we may better help him. Step forward and help. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm an artist, and I believe that you are an artist too. I love to create and collect images and objects and stories, but more than this, I love to share the process of creating and seeing what happens when people are being created together. Everyone that will stand up here today is an agent for social change. We see problems in the world and the challenges that face so many, and then we look for the solutions. Each of us here has different tools, and for me, the tool that I know is art. So how can art be part of the solution? 
art, especially when created together with others, can be a tool for social change within ourselves and within our communities. Art can be used to share your vision, to say something. Art can be used to bring people together, encouraging social interactions, friendships, connecting communities and neighbours. Art can transform a space for the better, make it more beautiful, more useful, more alive. Art can be for healing and for hope, for remembering and being remembered. For healing the painful memories and creating new ones. Art can stimulate thought, remind us to appreciate and can help develop an understanding of ourselves, each other and the world around us. Over the past year, Participate Arts has created... Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> have we, we've worked with a diverse range of people in a diverse range of settings. There's been a play park wall with a residence association, a beautiful memorial for babies that have died with a bereavement charity, small treasures and soaps with a play association, a 12-week course with young homeless people who are looking for what inspires them and what they aspire to. We have played and created in art galleries and at festivals and led managers in a morning of casting and creativity. We have felted and sculpted and sewn and stuck and cast and fired and varnished and drawn and designed and printed and written and drilled and dunked and dyed and cut and planted. And most importantly of all, we have talked and we have listened. We've seen with our own eyes how participating in art that is created with meaning in community does indeed work as a tool to improve our world. The evidence for this is in the young man who had lost education, family and home through ADHD and every other attention inhibiting syndrome they could throw at him, who shook with the very effort of sitting still long enough to sculpt a small simple piece of ceramic, but then laughed and smiled with pride when he saw what he had created and achieved or the talented but troubled girl who regularly smashed up her room but said she would never smash up the things that she had made because they had real value and they showed her what she could do. Then there were the bereaved families who were so grateful to do a loving act for their lost children. And then the residents who just walked past the play park wall every day, pointing out the parts that they created, remembering who they made them with, the lunch that we all had together and the paint that got all over the town hall. Our projects have so far largely been funded by grants, sponsorship, workshop fees. But going forward, we'd like to move towards a more, more corporate involvement where companies and organisations could utilise our workshops to train and motivate staff or make art for the workplace. They would also know that they're supporting art as a tool for social change and for those who really need it. Perhaps we can even find some ways of combining the two, the bank managers together with the disadvantaged teenagers, creatively engaged with what they are making and with each other. So if you're interested in what you've heard here, we would love to hear from you on our store. Thank you. Everybody. and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today because I'm one of those dark horses. I'm from dentistry and I know that 25% of the audience here are actually not very happy about going to the dentist. This is why our Focus Oral Health CIC company has been set up to bring dentistry out of the clinic into the community. My background is a clinical dental hygienist and I spent many years working in special care dentistry, caring for people who had additional diverse needs those with challenging behaviour, mental health needs, um, substance misuse, medically compromised. What we've worked out is it's all very well when people can come to us, but what about the ones that can't get to dentists? I had the privilege of looking after a gentleman in a hospital care bed, and sadly his mouth had not been looked after, and it was absolutely devastating to see the effect that had on his family and his relationship. We currently deliver dental nurse training in the hope that dental nurses can go out and take dental messages, public health messages, into the community. But sadly, they're still not fully utilised. 29% of the public are living regularly with dental pain. We want to change that. And it is about your responsibility. It's about everybody in this room 
having responsibility for their oral health, but it's actually about improving your response ability. You need to help yourselves with the information we can share with you to reduce disease risk. We're talking about dental disease here. We've got 25,500 children of school age having teeth routinely extracted, ages 5 to 15. That was last year. We've also got 12% of three-year-olds, that the children before getting to school with dental disease. We can make a difference. We don't want to do treatment. We're here to help you not to need treatment. Cost economic-wise, lost hours in work for work performance, dental pain impacts on that. We've actually also got issues around looking at NHS treatment costs. There's a lot there, inappropriate attendance to GPs, A&E attendance. We need to reduce all that. We've actually thinking about the link now to diabetes and mouth cancer. You need to be aware of this. It is all linked. Social functioning. What price is that if you have a diseased mouth? I'm sorry to reiterate this, but we've seen too much of it now. We're doing it differently. Um, our primary role is actually looking at working with people who need that additional help. It's working with the needs. It's about eating, appearance, speech, and you. It has a whole impact on the whole person. I'm actually also working with a homeless project at the moment, part funded by Health Watch Plymouth, which helps to actually reduce <coughs> decay rates with people who absolutely have nothing else. We need that social voice to be heard, and at the moment it's not. I'm delighted to say we've also got direct access now, and for those of you who do not understand that, it's about dental hygienists now being able to see members of the public independently. Our regulatory body has allowed that. That's after 35 years of waiting. I'm delighted to report that to you. We have got clinical evidence that needs to be used. We've also got issues around dementia. We're trying to raise awareness to have one less worry for those people now with early onset dementia. Preventive dental care needs to be in there sooner than later. I'd like to really thank my husband, Steve, for his tolerance of my purpose. My colleague, Lorraine, in the back. My mentor in the back over there, Noel, and the SSE programme for giving me the choice. Thank you very much. because I got cross. I got cross at the way I was put into a stock room to try a wig on. I got cross at the doctors when I was dismissed once all the initial questions had been asked. After all, hair loss isn't my thing. And I got cross when I went to the specialist who had nothing to tell me and nothing to show me, uh, no advice, nowhere to try, no one to talk to, Oh, I did get a lopsided piece of A4 paper through the post, which again told me nothing. Bassey Jones was that little idea in my head. I didn't know what to do with it. I had a couple of clients that had bought wigs from me. Um, they were ladies of a certain age who I'd met through doing talks with the WI. When somebody suggested that I try to get a place on the Lloyd's SSE programme, I didn't even understand what it meant. But I went to home and I got my place on the course, and here I am today. The course has given me the confidence to believe in myself, that what I have to offer others is actually worth offering. And, and what Battersea Jones offers is a one-to-one -one consultation service at home, which means that people feel safe and comfortable. The selling of good quality products, which I can personally vouch for, and the giving of talks to groups. At least that was what I thought it offered. Over this last year, I have realised that it offers more than that. The people I have met range from being completely at ease with hair loss to being numb with fear, anxiety, loss of self-esteem, lack of confidence and depressed. I met a lady last week who, when she rang me, ended up in tears on the phone 
because she was so relieved to finally be talking to somebody who understood what she was saying. When I saw her, her lack of confidence was painful. And although her hair loss is not severe yet, to her, it is devastating. She has spent hundreds of pounds on lotions, potions and disastrous wigs, all because there was no one to talk to, no one to ask what to do. When she went to her doctor, a woman by the way, she was asked the usual questions, had a couple of blood tests, and then when nothing was highlighted, was dismissed with the words, at least it won't kill me. I think that is truly wicked. Hair loss might not be life-threatening, but is it, is it okay to feel like this lady feels? I don't believe it is. If you can relate to this or identify with this in any way and you'd like to help, you can do so by giving me the opportunity to talk to people and groups who are suffering with hair loss, by giving me the chance to meet health professionals who work with these groups, and I would like to produce an information leaflet that could go into doctors' surgeries and hospitals. Could you help me with that? It has taken me all year to understand what social enterprise means. I think I finally understood the other day when the husband of a client said thank you to me. Thank you for giving my wife her confidence back. Thank you for giving me my wife back. guess I'm not an SSE graduate. You can probably guess by looking at me that I might work for a bank. Um, but you can tell I've dressed down today because I'm not wearing a tie. But I am a mentor on the SSE programme and I just wanted to talk a little bit about mentoring. Um, why did I get involved? Um, one of the reasons was that the programme encourages businesses that have a social rather than a purely commercial agenda, which is what we generally encounter in the bank. So how did I meet uh, my mentee? That was rather strange, actually. Um, it was rather like a group blind date, I guess. Um, Forty people, all in one room, thinking we're here and we're going to sort of get together as mentor and mentee, but who are we going to actually be allocated? Now, the SAC called it random matching. But anyway, it worked for me, and I met, uh, met with Denise, and we actually got on very well. Our first meeting was um, in a pub, actually, not at my suggestion, um, but actually it started a trend and perhaps that tells you that even if you have five business meetings in a pub, they can actually be affected. Um, obviously no alcohol was on the agenda either. We actually discussed the business plan and the process of her, her project, which you'll hear about later. So what did I do as a mentor? Um, I listened, I clarified, I encouraged, I was sounding board and I questioned. I helped her prioritise what she was trying to do, I suggested options and I suggested some practical solutions. I took notes of each meeting and I sent a summary email as a reminder for both of us of what we had discussed. So what was it like for me personally? It was completely different to anything I'd done before. It opened my eyes to a world and a person who had very little of self but wanted to make a difference to others. It was quite humbling. The thing I did notice, and I think you probably gathered that from the presentations we had earlier, is that the project was solely dependent on the person. Without her energy and commitment, it was likely to fail. It was a massive responsibility for her. And in conclusion, what I'd say is it's given me a great respect for social enterprises and all they do in the community. At a time when government support and grants are substantially reduced, they're trying to plug the gaps in society that have appeared. I think it's tremendous that all of them have kept their enterprises going for a year and are able to graduate today. 
So would I be a mentor again? Of course. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Autism is a lifelong incurable condition. It impairs communication, social interaction and sensory processing. And if you have a look at the slide, this tries to give an impression what it might be like if you happen to make sense of the world looking at this kind of thing. And also earlier on, when we had that little noise in the background, imagine if you went through life being unable to block out any noise like that all the time. That is just an approximation of what the sensory processing side of autism could all be all about. So it's no wonder that people who have to live their lives in a world like that might be struggling with communication. Now here's a shocking statistic. 85% of adults with autism don't have a full-time job. Now to me, that is a waste, a colossal waste of human potential and a blight on our society. People, in the work, people with autism in the workplace can often be very effective in their jobs, but they often struggle with people skills. And unfortunately, people skills in the modern world are key to success in the workplace and everywhere else. So, if you imagine what it must be like again, people in the workplace with autism live in a disabling world. They're not visibly disabled, but because they're not visibly disabled, they're often left unsupported. So the work the world of work disables them. Now, to me, this isn't just about statistics. I have a son myself, 15-year-old, with autism, and I worry daily about his future. And I stand up, I want to stand up and fight for his right and the rights of thousands of others like him to have quality education and a fulfilling job. But we can work on this. If we look again, we can bring things into a clearer focus. Working well with autism aims to bridge the gap in understanding between the world of autism and the world of us neurotypicals. We aim to build an enabling world, not a disabling world. And we do this by offering work, specialist workplace support, consultancy and training to individuals and to organisations. Working well with autism wants to develop the autism enablers of tomorrow. We believe in full inclusion we follow a person-centred approach. We believe that the world of work, places of work, can be transformed by encouraging staff to become enablers as part of their everyday working lives. <coughs> so in the end, a clearer picture emerges, a clear positive version of the future that is possible when perception <coughs> shifts from a problem to actual solutions. Everyone benefits from working in harmonious working and living environments. The person with autism themselves, their employers, and society at large. And better understanding will inevitably lead to better communication, and that is quite important because 80% of problems faced by people with autism in the workplace are linked in some way to communication. Now, our work with Working Well with Autism has only just begun. We now need to scale up and we want to um, access some additional investment to build a robust e-learning platform to train the enablers of tomorrow. So, I'm asking people today if they're able to help in any way, whether it is with accessing funding, grant funding, additional investment, or in any other way, please come and see us afterwards and we'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. body stood in front of this judging mirror. It laughs and it calls me fat, ugly, pathetic, nothing. I believe every word and that's what makes me cry. I break down almost every single night waiting to change the way I look, the way I feel. No more the fat girl, says the skinny girl. 
No more being dumb, says a clever girl. No more being yourself, says society. I stare at my reflection. I don't know this person anymore. I'm scared of every thought that she thinks. I've cut in her arms, I've cut in her legs, I've cut in her thighs. And running thoughts of suicide. When I look in the mirror, all I see is hell. But wait, no, that's just life looking back at me. Instead of explaining the issues that have motivated me to develop pink parachutes in my own words, I decided that it's not my voice that you needed to hear, but the voices of so many young women who echo this self-belief. This courageous poem was written by Annabel Johnson and reflects the effects that abusive influences and societal expectations have on self-esteem. So what do we do at Pink Parachute? We get outside. Outside of the house, outside of the pain, outside of the head. Initially, these young women don't always see how being in the woods has anything to do with a person staring back, back at them in the mirror. But making cosmetics and thinking about clothes and looking at nutrition, maybe that's something a little bit more interesting. So we do both. We start gently to explore the person in the mirror. And the idea that beauty is about being comfortable with who you are once you really get to know who you are. These young women not only explore what it is to be a woman, but what it could be like to be a woman who smiles back at them from the reflection in that mirror. Having the space and the peace of just being in the natural environment can be the most transformative aspect of what we do. Often these young women, this is the only time they have away from the chaos and often abusive environments in which they live. Raising self-esteem through learning new skills through Pink Parachute, some of these amazing young women have gone on to get apprenticeships, jobs and back to school. They are in fact empowering their own lives. My own journey through nature-based learning has always been inspired by the connection between people and nature. Working as a forest schools practitioner, I noticed a massive gap in the back opportunities for young women from vulnerable backgrounds to get outside and engage with activities that they can identify with. My interest in women's health and well-being helped me to develop Pink Parachute model that I've been piloting now for three years. I've done with grant funding and now we've got on to have paid commissions and we're starting to develop our own brand of natural cosmetics. Teaching the group to make skincare products has led on to creating a brand that's not only good for the body and the environment, but also selling our products will help to support the continuation of inclusive courses for the women that need them the most. We're aiming to provide apprenticeships and jobs that develop creative and business skills through the production, marketing and selling of our natural cosmetics. I put some samples of soap in your goodie bags and thank my husband most dearly for wrapping lots and lots of very small pieces of soap. There's also a range of products on my stall that you can come along and try, have a smell and have a feel of. If anyone has any help they can give with branding and marketing, I'd really like to talk to you. But what Pink Parachute really needs is your voice to get out the message that these young women are worth investing in. Because if you don't believe it, neither will they. Thank you. In 2009, my life was turned upside down when my 15-year-old daughter, Jess, developed severe mental health issues. In a six-month period, she went from leading a normal life to being admitted to the Adolescent Psychiatric Unit here in Plymouth. She was suffering with depression, severe anxiety, self-harm and an eating disorder. She described herself as a freak. At 15 years old, she actually wanted to die. And my sense of failure as a parent was massive. In one week's time, my beautiful daughter Jess celebrates her 21st birthday. She now lives a fully independent life, 
and as proof that recovery is achievable. But one in five young people will experience symptoms of depression, anxiety and low body confidence. If left unchecked, half of those, one in ten, will develop a mental illness. That is three young people in every single class in this country. I never expected my child to be one of those three. My project is simply called The Project to, to avoid stigmatising those who attend. A year ago, we launched our pilot early intervention service in Axminster, where we, we run weekly support groups for 13 to 24 year olds from across East Devon who are experiencing issues with their emotional and mental well-being. Our groups help to reduce the sense of isolation experienced by young people, allow them to take part in confidence building activities and to learn coping strategies and gives them an opportunity to talk to others who really understand. We also run a monthly support group for parents so they too have a space to share their frustrations, their bewilderment and their fear. When she came to us at 17, Chloe had totally given up on her education. Anxiety made her a prisoner in her own home. Since attending the project, she has passed her driving test and is now looking for work. Mark, at 22, had been sectioned three times in the year before attending the project, but has since returned to work with renewed confidence. And there are many more stories like this. But we need support to take the project to the next stage. We are currently funded through grants and donations, and our service costs £40,000 a year, supporting around 40 to 50 young people and their families. £40,000 is the cost of running the Adolescent Psychiatric Unit for one single week. Just spent five months there. Through commissioning or further funding, we would like to roll out our successful early intervention model into other areas to meet demand. A thousand pound could sponsor a one year placement at the project, or a hundred pound, a confidence building field trip for our young people. And we want to deliver more mental health awareness talks and, and workshops in schools and the community to change attitudes to mental illness. I would welcome speaking to anyone who can help us achieve these goals. Mental health problems belong to all of us. Prevention is cheaper and far more effective than cure. And I invite you to share my vision to invest in our young people and their futures. If you would like to help support the project, please come and find me afterwards at my stand. Thank you very much. Just me trying to be healthy. <laughs> be um, hello. Um, I suppose I was going to ask people where you come from, really. Where do you come from? Where do you come from? Where do you come from? I was born an orphan and raised by white people on an all white council estate. And I didn't meet another black person who even looked like me until I was 16 years old. Up north, they're not backwards in coming forwards. Every day I'd be asked, oh, you, where do you come from? I didn't know. I had no idea. No knowledge of my parents at all. But clearly, I'm not from here, I thought. I didn't know it then, but I was starring in my very own orphan story. And I told myself that story over and over again until I understood the value of it. So that's where I'm coming from. I set up Story Jug to help other people dream their way out of trouble by telling stories, real and imagined, funny and tragic, reflective and provocative. I believe the fundamental power of story is its role as a medium. 
Like DNA, story carries the evidence of our humanity. As humans, we may well be dogged with deficiencies of one kind and another, but our strengths and talents will win the day. They're part of the story too. I call these our diamonds in the rough. A diamond has to be cut before it's polished. Story job workshops help clients search for diamonds so their stories become a source of power and their future happiness. Okay, does it work? Well, the evidence. Well, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've worked with the Red Cross, asylum seekers and refugees. I've worked with MIND. I've worked with substance abusers. Um, I've worked with young people with mental health difficulties and lots of different agencies. And, and it does work. It doesn't work for everybody, but it certainly works for the people where there's a chime, where story hasn't been developed um, for, for them. But by far the most prolific researcher in this area is a guy called James Pennebaker, who is a social psychologist in America. He's discovered that whilst having a traumatic experience actually is really bad for us, those people who have a trauma and keep that experience secret and keep it to themselves are far, far more worse off. His evidence points to the value of writing, stroke storytelling, so it doesn't have to be writing, it could be film, it could be verbal, it could be oral, um, as a process in and of itself. There's no need to go public with the story. Privately expressing angst, anger, and heartfelt sadness is enough, so long as the feelings leave our mind, leave our heart, and leave our soul. It's about externalisation. The, the power is in the process of externalisation and organisation, organising our feelings. When feelings are organised into some kind of report, artistic, written, or otherwise, when we put our suffering under our own surveillance, that's when we experience a sense of control over it. And that's when we get some relief. I've written a white paper summarising some of these, some of the key evidence and the key findings, and you can, you, if you're interested, you can pick a copy of that up for me later on. Sadly, there are lots of people who struggle to overcome difficulties, and they fail to thrive, despite generous amounts of practical and medical support being chucked at them. People who have lived through trauma, the bereaved, recovering addicts, the long-term depressed, they don't need to be victims of their story. Story job workshops provide a private space in a public place where people can participate, reflect, dream, and go diamond hunting. It's a cost-effective way for clients to examine their story and be enriched by it. I need you to help me build on the existing evidence of the value of this work by providing me with an opportunity to help people you know, your clients, by helping people grow, change and thrive. I need you to give more people a chance to find their voice and to use it on themselves. So then, who am I? Well, I'm Joanna Trainer. I'm an author, I'm a TV producer, but I retrained as a psychotherapist and a coach and I'm a story job creator. And where am I from? Well, I'm from the place where all things are possible, if only we can believe in ourselves. Thank you. system is entirely fucked in the head. That was a bailiff speaking on national TV just as he was about to make a family homeless. Now in my opinion, when a bailiff gets a conscience, we've got problems. <laughs> I created the Noah Project not only to help tackle food poverty locally, but also to identify the real issues that are driving the families to the food banks. Because without asking what's going on behind the scenes, simply handing out food and a cup of tea is like putting a band-aid on an amputated limb. So I asked the questions, and I opened Pandora's box. Broken bones and black eyes, little kids like these, or these, collapsing in schools because they haven't eaten for days, families hiding from loan sharks and bailiffs because they're behind on the bills. You name it, I saw it. By conservative estimates, approximately 350,000 men, women and children will go hungry today. 
yet the Department of Work and Pensions refused to admit that there's a problem still. Given that in 2013, over 105 families, uh, 105,000 families in Cornwall received food parcels, I tend to disagree. So I took a stand and the Noel project was born. Since our launch in February, we've supported over 70 local families on the breadline, providing clothes, toys, baby outings and furniture, completely free of charge, as well as providing emotional support and debt management advice to people in crisis. Recently, we met a girl who's literally lost everything. Husband, flat, pets, job, self-esteem, identity, all gone. She was sofa surfing and she carried everything she owned in two carrier bags. And she tried really, really hard to keep it together against the odds. But it got a bit too overwhelming and so she went to bed for a while. Not washing, not caring. And then she got a phone call that changed everything and she had to go to London to collect an award. And so I got up and I had a shower and I brushed my teeth and I'm here graduating today. Winning a place at Dartington SSE changed my life. Knowing that people like my are dear enough to support me gave me the confidence to make my vision a reality. We've won two awards this year so far. We've appeared on Sky TV. We're in the live finals of the Pitch Small Business competition and we'll feature in a well-known magazine at Christmas. We've achieved a huge amount in a short time, but we need expert help now to take us to the next level. We're currently working on opening a community kitchen where local families can come for a hot meal coffee, cake, or just for company. Isolation was an issue that we came across time and time again, and so our kitchen will address this by bringing the community together in a safe, relaxed environment. Meeting a business angel here today would be our dream come true. Someone well-connected who can help raise our profile and steer us in the right direction for growth. If anyone here today can offer us support, we'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, I would just like to thank everyone at SSE for this opportunity. Sheena, Sam, Dirk, Rosie, and my amazing friends here, Jane, G, Sarah, and Joe. Last, but definitely not least, my incredible mentor, Richard Oates. I couldn't have wished for a better support network. It's been a pleasure and a privilege, and I'm extremely proud to be graduating today. Welcome, Chris, and um, just wanted to tell you what we're going to be doing here. Um, one of the things we've noted is how difficult when you're trying to earn money for your family, keep an income going, and solve the issues of the world, is to get actually on time and get your bum on the seat in an SSE course. But I'd like to say that a couple of people have really... Um, uh, shown the greatest commitment and we've introduced this attendance award this year and I very much like Chris to join in this. This award is being presented to the students who have attended the most sessions throughout the past year, whether it's been study days, action learning sets, mentoring meetings or tutorials, they've demonstrated the highest level of commitment and taken every opportunity to get the most from the programme. And to present this award, I'm delighted to welcome to the platform Councillor Chris Pember, the Cabinet Member for Cooperative Housing and Community Safety. And I've done this for a reason, because Chris has been an absolutely great friend to our school here in Plymouth. Um, since we secured the Lloyds Bank Social Entrepreneurship Programme, he's shown both personal and the City Council have shown great support to our programme and the students. So would you please welcome Chris. Just before I open the envelope, so many amazing stories, and it's hard to think that it's only just over a year ago that I met you all at Elliot Ellis. You were all tired because you'd had your first day. You were all petrified about what the year was going to hold. You weren't quite sure how you were going to get on with each other, and look what's happened. I think that's absolutely amazing. And you know, even just from that workshop that I came and met you all again in Dartington to now, you've all come so far. 
I think you should all be very, very proud of yourselves. And like Sheena, I don't know the names in the song place. <laughs> So, the student entrepreneurs have achieved the highest attendance rate during the past year are Bill Taylor, Fran Marriott, and Rob de Jong. And let me put something for all of you. Imagine if overnight somebody stole all of the trees in your neighbourhood. What do you think you may have lost? Trees are the biggest and yet the most undervalued natural asset that we possess. However, in the UK, we have some of the lowest tree cover in our towns and cities. In the United States, the average is around 30%. In Europe, it's around 20, 25%. In the UK, the average is just 10% tree cover. Now, at school, I, I failed all my GCSEs, and um, I didn't have a clue, really, what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And it wasn't long before my dad got fed up with me lounging around the house and said, come on, get out to work. And my dad's a forester, and on that very first day, I knew exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my career. And I've been working with trees now for the last 24 years. I got those GCSEs, I got to go to forestry college, and last year I finally got my Masters in Forest Ecosystem Management. Two years ago, tree economics became a social enterprise. Our mission was to work with communities, public bodies and businesses together on collaborative projects to get out there and highlight the massive value of trees to us as humans. My enterprise was commissioned to run a pilot project in Torbay, an audit of all the trees, and we produced a report. And the results were quite staggering. As an example, the trees in Torbay remove the air pollution that's emitted from around 53,000 family cars every single year. If we had to pay for that service, it would cost £1.4 million every single year. Isn't that an asset worth caring for? Talk about value for money. And by taking this value approach, Torbay also now has the data to form a strategy to maintain and improve this asset. And we can now use this information for a whole host of different things, including the planting of the right kinds of tree in the right places. If we don't value our trees, accountants and the like, they have no option but to value them at nothing. And that's a great shame, because trees provide multiple benefits, all at the same time, at very little cost. Trees provide shade. They store carbon, which lowers the effects of climate change. They improve our health and well-being. Tree-lined high streets encourage greater consumer spending. Also, employees with a view of a green environment are less likely to be stressed. The list of benefits would fill a book. And in fact, the truth
trees would even make that book. So now, as we scale up, I need help and support with business development. And also, do you know anybody responsible for green spaces, parks, gardens and trees at any level? Mayors, town councillors, community environmental groups, developers, town planners, anybody that needs to value their trees. Please get in touch so we can have a face-to-face -face meeting and so that we can work together and help us to grow our tree cover because we don't want 10%. We don't even want 20%. Let's go for 30% and more. And let's leave a legacy for our children. A greener, tree-filled environment. are important and I'll tell you why they're important. They can empower or marginalise an individual. When I was a child I was often described by my maternal grandmother as a banana short of a picnic. I was different. I had health issues and also my brain worked differently. This meant that I couldn't access education or work in a normal way. However, I still managed to qualify as a teacher and also create and run programmes for disadvantaged individuals and their families in my local community. Around four years ago, my professional and personal experiences were utilised to create a new programme for my youngest son. Then aged seven, he'd been given several labels. Amongst them were on the autistic spectrum, cognitive auditory processing disorder, ADHD and sensory issues. It is believed that he was brain damaged at birth. Because he did not feel safe in the world, he would tie himself up with almost tragic consequences. He heard voices. Some professionals thought that he was showing signs of schizophrenia, others that he was lonely and imagining friends, but intuitively I knew as his mum that he just didn't recognise his own very critical thinking voice and needed to make friends with it. He was desperately unhappy and at times unmanageable. He was four years behind with his maths and couldn't read. He was socially isolated. Many professionals tried to help him with limited success. It wasn't their fault as teachers, health and social care professionals. It wasn't mine or my husband's fault. It wasn't even society's fault as a whole or my young son's fault. It was, I believed instead, a failure of approach. We all have our intellectual challenges. Einstein couldn't speak until he was four, and he was never a brilliant speaker, but he didn't need to be. Unfortunately, children whose brains work differently as a result of health, educational or social care issues are often stigmatised as lacking in ability, when in fact they may be of average, above average or even gifted ability. I related <coughs> myself as neurologically diverse. That was the only label that we needed, and it empowered us. I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel. There were many, many non-medical interventions and therapies that I felt could help him. There were also many resources and facilities in my local community that could be utilised. I also went about creating a unique network of experts from both here and abroad. And I was very fortunate, actually, to find some very close to home, like Dr Lane from the Arrow Programme, and Nick from Cool Boards. My aims were to coach, nurture, and nudge his brain pathways into making new connections or simply strengthening other neural pathways. Essentially, I held and developed who my son was and the strengths of his neural diversity, like loving to move and learn at the same time, not something that most classrooms can cope with, combined with a brilliant memory and an intellect while strengthening those areas of the brain that weren't allowing him to be the best he could be. Today, his teacher can find no trace of his ADHD. He can read, and his age is appropriate for maths. And he doesn't tie himself up anymore, or kick chunks out of himself or the world. He doesn't have parties where none of his peers turn up. Instead, comfortable in his own skin, he's quirky, and he's popular. My approach has been successfully piloted in a local school, and is about to be run from our centre in Exeter. Thanks to the 
sponsorship of Devon County Council NHS Health and Social Care Commissioners and one person in particular there who's acted as a real critical friend to me. Parents and carers are also making a financial contribution so that we can run the centre and we're also having support from our lead pre-pilot school. This is really a community coming together to work together to, to enable our children to be the very best they can be. Two leading universities have agreed in principle to pool resources and expertise to further research and develop my approach. And I have recently put in a number of funding applications to further this research and development. As for my nan labelling me a banana short of a picnic, my <coughs> picnic has never contained bananas, only passion fruit. <laughs> gentlemen, one of our fellow students, fellow travellers, uh, the lovely Ben Hughes, is already so successful as a social entrepreneur uh, that he's in the midst now of a contract, uh, working contract in Amman. And very sadly, he's the only one of us who can't be with us today. Uh, so with his permission, I'd like to read his story uh, and tell you about his success. Uh, ben Hughes, who lives in Plymouth, runs an organisation called Rue Slack. And Ruslack's aim is to create social capital by developing and educating people through the medium of slacklining, which I think of as low-level type of walking, uh, if you've never come across it before, and to encourage people outside into the natural environment. And Ben says, Ruslack's inception came while I was at university, looking at whether the rapidly expanding sport of slacklining could be used as a tool to engage young people who either were at risk of or who were offending. I wanted to help provide an area where the young people in our society had the ability to make the right choices and see the benefit from doing so. I believe that everybody has the ability to achieve great things if they're given the means and area to do so. I myself made the wrong choices when I was younger and the opportunities that I had in the outdoors helped show me that there was another way for people to achieve. In the last year and a half, we've worked with over 10,000 people, ranging from young people and summer sport packages to providing slight lining at extreme sports festivals. We have delivery contracts from both the council and police and crime commissioner for our services, and we're currently in talks with a large clothing company that want to support us financially. I honestly don't think Rue Slack would have, been gained, would have gained as much momentum as it has without being part of the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Being one of the SSE cohort holds you to account, not only to yourself, but to your fellow peers. Starting up and running a social enterprise can be lonely. SSE gives you a place to be recognized for even the little steps of progress that you make. It really does give you a morale boost. I would like to thank both the staff at SSE for being so supportive and helpful, and the rest of my cohort for always being so understanding and patient with me at times. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Hughes, a voice from Oman. Well, it's my, my husband's perception of me when I'm well and when depression has its grip. Um, I'm really pleased to say, say that I'm stood here today feeling quite well, but for the last 11 years, um, depression's been a relentless opponent of mine. Um, I was diagnosed with depression in 2002, and it all came to head in 2005 when I lost my job because of it. My mental health declined rapidly. I became scared to leave the house, lost my appetite, gave up on self-care, and lost the tooth as a result. I couldn't see a happy future. I felt I was a waste of a life. In the past three years, I've been trying to draw something positive from those experiences by helping other people with mental health problems. Not only has this helped me to come to terms with my experiences of depression, but it doesn't feel as though I lost my 20s for nothing. I feel passionate about the employment, um, 
the role employment plays in recovery and want to help those who are struggling to remain in work. Work gives us a sense of purpose, a routine, financial independence and time with other people. Five of the ten leading causes of disability worldwide are mental health problems. Last year, 70 million working days were lost to mental illness, costing the economy between 70 and 100 billion pounds. Mental health is becoming something we simply cannot ignore any longer. Yesterday, we launched We Can Work Out to address this problem. It is a membership site for employers. For an annual subscription of £349, we support employers in supporting employees, <coughs> helping them to bridge the gap in communication and in time with the law. We Can Work Out encourages employers to play a proactive role rather than a reactive one. We're focusing on SMEs who often don't have the resources in-house that larger enterprises do. Our resources include free HR support, access to experts and people with lived experience with mental health problems. Employers are kept up to date with legislation changes and are given a platform to network with their peers. I do also have experience with creating a national brand, as in 2011 my husband and I founded the Blurt Foundation. Blurt provides free information support to those affected by depression. We've won an award, received national press, interviewed Ruby Wax and Johnny Wilkerson. We've nurtured our social media community and now have over 16,000 Facebook fans and over 9,000 Twitter followers. Despite achieving all of this, I wasn't well myself. I was fearful of everyday things, scared to leave the house on my own, and spent a lot of time where I felt to say, my bed. I spent a lot of time in what I call my bed office, not feeling like a member of society. I wanted to do more, to be more, but I felt trapped. I'm not sure why I applied to SSC. It seemed like a ridiculous idea at the time, as I was struggling to leave the house on my own. Perhaps a part of me really didn't believe I'd be picked, but here I am. The SSC knew of my mental health problems. It gave me a chance anyway. They believed in me, supported me, made allowances for me, and nurtured me. I have loved spending time with the other students. They've all inspired me and lifted me by the lorry mode. Um, I've felt a shift in it last year. I've grown someone I can like and someone I can respect. It feels like I've been given a gift, and that's exo- exactly what we'd like to achieve with We Can Work It Out, to assist employers in giving that gift to their employees. In my past ventures, profit has always felt like a dirty word, as though I was greedy for chasing it. I understand it's probably linked to my low self-esteem. Being a social enterprise just fits for me. I can see the magic, the possibilities and opportunities profit can bring, how it can change the lives of so many people. In order to have in order to have a thriving bottom line and to be sustainable, we need your help. Help with marketing, connections, corporate partnerships, funds. We've built the platform, we've built the brand. We now have to position ourselves in the marketplace so that we can make a real difference. Thank you. Thank you all. So 19 truly creative, passionate and inspiring graduates from our programme. And with those 19, actually at this time of year, there will be 300 graduates from this kind of programme, this SSE Startup programme. And these new graduates will join 1,500 SSE fellows who have already graduated from our programme and have become, as we call them, SSE fellows. And to mark this formally, I'm very pleased to have the Deputy Lord Mayor with us today, who will give an address and present the Certificate of Fellowship to our students. Deputy Lord Mayor, I would like to congratulate all 19 of you for your creative, energetic and inspiring projects. This marks the conclusion of a 12-month long professional and personal development program. Each one of you went through a thorough and competitive application progress to gain one of the limited places on the funded program. A business mentor and a £4,000 grant towards the development of your organisation. I would like to thank the funders, sponsors and corporate partners. Without them, none of this would be achievable. I would also like to give a big thank you to the Lloyds mentors who gave up their time to support these entrepreneurs. Plymouth as a city and the South West region are at the forefront of social enterprise activity in the UK 
with Plymouth and Bristol becoming the first designated social enterprise cities in England. Plymouth City Council recognises the contribution social, social enterprises make to the city's economy. According to the 2012 SEM survey, there, there, there are 150 social enterprises in Plymouth employing 7,000 people and generating 500 million in turnover. The council itself wants to be more entrepreneurial and cooperative to modernise the way it operates and delivers services to the people of Plymouth. It sees social enterprise as a key partner in delivering these services. The Heart of England, LEP, acknowledges the vital contribution social enterprises can make to achieving good jobs and good growth in our area. Plymouth welcomes new social entrepreneurs and does everything it can to provide a supportive <coughs> business environment in which social enterprises can thrive. The city in particular appreciates the work of the School for Social Entrepreneurs in Plymouth. Now in its second year, the SSE programme has brought 160k of direct investment into the city in the form of start-up grants and supports 40 social <coughs> entrepreneurs to set up a new social enterprise for the benefit of communities in Plymouth and the South West. Well done to you all. You all should be extremely proud of yourselves. And on behalf of the City of Plymouth, I wish you all every success for the future. Thank you. Gareth Russell. Jane Hardy. <coughs> Francis Marriott.
Joanna. Thank you all for kind of being with us here for these presentations, and we've got a lot more for you in store. Uh, we've got refreshments out there and a wonderful exhibition.